Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AI for Good Innovation Factory. Uh, my name is Josh Choi from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and I'm very happy to moderate today's Innovation Factory session. Uh, ITU is the uh, United Nations Specialized Agency for ICTs, and we are also the organizer of the AI for Good Global Summit in partnership with 40 UN sister agencies and co combined with Switzerland. Uh, the Innovation Factory is a program launched in 2020 under the flagship initiative AI for Good Global Summit. It originally started as an online pitching platform for startups, and this year it has been upgraded as more like an accelerating program that we help startups grow and scale their innovative AI solutions to achieve the SDGs by providing uh, various you know, business opportunities and mentoring services and matchmaking with potential investors and partners, and plus even some cash prizes, and et cetera. Uh, today's session is the fourth of uh, this year's series. The winner of each session is invited to the grand finale at the end of the year. And through the year, uh, not only the winner, but also the other also good teams will be supported to grow and scale up through the help of our partners and startup accelerators and incubators, et cetera, so that we can actually trace how the innovation factory startups grow and evolve through the year and how they are making impact. Especially today's session is organized in partnership with Shell, AI for Good Global spon uh, Gold Sponsor. So thanks to this partnership, we are able to meet a very interesting startup today that contributes to uh, decarbonization in the agriculture and forest sector, which is also, I believe, in a crucial global challenge to overcome. And also through this partnership, the finalists today will have a very interesting opportunities and get competitive prize package. Okay, um, now, okay, let me kick start today's session. Uh, firstly, let me introduce some of the benefits that we are prepared for the winner and the, um, and the best teams. Okay, Julian, maybe you can share this, the slide or otherwise I will just uh, explain bubbly. All right, okay. So the winner of today will receive a 20,000 USD cash prize. And also the winner will be invited, as I mentioned, Innovation Factory Grand Finale Demo Day Ticket. And also they will have a featured startup in the Innovation Factory Exhibition on the AI for Good Neural Network, which is the global virtual network with thousands and thousands of people working here. Um, uh, Julia, I think I sent the wrong one. So this is not the one, so you can just, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. And then also uh, we, were, we are going to announce the winner today. However, after this session, the Share Game Changer team will select some good teams who will be qualified to be invited to Share's Game Changer program to progress a proof of concept in a phased approach over a period of up to six months. So through the six months, they'll be very much carefully taken care of uh, by the Share Game Changer team to, to make the proof of concept and then to, to improve uh, their uh, solutions and the scale up. So it will be really, really interesting, also very important opportunity for all the startups who participate today to um, make their ideas and solution into action. Okay, this is the uh, basically the, uh, the benefits that we prepared. Okay, and also I'd like to introduce our distinguished judges today. So firstly, uh, Mr. Srinivas uh, Lagavendran, who is the Shell Game Changer Commercial Partnership Manager. So Srinivas, uh, maybe can you tell us a little bit about yourself and also the Game Changer program? Uh, Srinivas, can you turn on your camera and then can, turn on your microphone? Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, 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 I'm Srinivas, uh, I work as a game changer in Shell. I've been with Shell uh, 16 years and in the industry 22 years. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by background and training and uh, I've done quite some extensive work on technology development and deployment of for Shell. Speaking about game changer program itself, it's been around for 25 years. 
and it's uh, the primary aim of game changer is to nurture early stage startups uh, in order to mature their idea from just an idea into a proof of concept technology readiness level 0 or 1 to about 4 or 5 and we have worked with quite a number of startups globally and our uh, focus is around the area of energy more so in the area of new energies and agriculture and forestry as josh rightly said yeah that's about myself and i live and work in bangalore i'm done thank you very much srinivas and thank you for your time and also thanks a lot uh, for providing a lot of interesting opportunity from the share game change program today so we are very excited to uh, see who will be the winner and then also thanks a lot for your uh, contribution all right so also we have uh, miss lina tan who is the global head of marketing digital and pricing for Shell Agriculture and Forestry. So Lina, please tell us about how Shell is transforming the agriculture and forest sector and also what kind of startup you will look for today and so a little bit of an introduction about yourself, please. Sure, thanks Josh. Um, hi everybody, my name is Lynette. Uh, as Josh mentioned, I'm the Global Head of Marketing, Digital and Pricing for the Shell Agri and Forestry team. I'm based out in Singapore, but I have a global remit in terms of looking at our customers and partners worldwide, specifically targeting um, customers and partners in the agri and forestry sectors. Uh, our vision for Shell Agri and Forestry is to enhance quality of life by supporting the production of uh, food, clean air, water, and soil by offering purposeful, sustainable solutions to the sector, um, and also creating value for them for everybody within the sector and contributing towards decarbonization and sustainability um, across the many different sectors uh, in conjunction with our other lines of business. Uh, as for startups, and I'm really excited to be uh, here today uh, in terms of partnering with some of you or maybe um, you know a, a bigger pool of you in fact um, to kind of look at can we co-create or develop further solutions to help the sector and accelerate um, our ambitions towards net zero in a quicker way so thanks Josh. Thank you very much Lynette and then also uh, thanks a lot for your time and that's we are also excited to see uh, how Shell is in moving forward to, to achieve the SDG from the side as well. All right, so uh, certainly we have uh, Mr. Eric White, who is the head of Tech for SDGs at World Economic Forum. So Eric, thanks a lot for joining us today. And it would be great if you can also tell us what your team is trying to achieve and how World Economic Forum is working to maximize the effect of technologies in achieving SDGs and also about your current work as well. Okay, happy to. Um, I'm not able to start my video because it says the host has stopped it. So um, if you can restart mine, that would be that would be great. Um, otherwise, I'll just speak. Uh, so nice to meet everybody. Eric White, head of tech for the SDGs at the World Economic Forum. Uh, my role there is to run a, um, a program across our Center for Nature and Climate, which focuses on climate, nature, food, water, oceans, and uh, circular economy. Um, we look for how cutting edge technologies can create systems unlocks on those topics, allowing uh, problems where we've been stuck for a decade or more to be advanced significantly uh, by conceptualizing new models of addressing them. Uh, we've done uh, a lot of work in particular, in particular on agriculture, uh, looking at how we can leverage recent advances in uh, geospatial technology, uh, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, et cetera. So I'm really thrilled to be here and uh, to listen to the presenters today. Great, thank you very much, Eric. And so we're also looking forward to uh, so further collaboration between World Economic Forum and ITU. And also, yeah, we definitely can see something. All right, great, thanks a lot. Again, okay, so lastly, uh, we have, uh, Lastly, uh, uh, we have uh, Joseph uh, Kinzel, who is the agriculture engineer from uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. So Joseph, can you tell us also how FAO is revolutionizing the agriculture sector and also especially your role as an agricultural engineer? Yes, hello everybody. I'm happy to be in this uh, exciting forum. My name is Joseph Kinzel from the FAO here in Rome, Italy. Um, we, we're dealing with 
in my area, all sorts of tools, equipment, and machineries for agricultural production all along the value chain. But recently, we all have started scouting for precision agricultural technologies, lean mechanization, more precise uh, applications, and also specifically reduce on the tillage side, zero till, till conservation agriculture, which is proved to improve soil health and a more healthy agricultural soil is able to, to, to take on carbon, to store carbon as a, become a carbon sink. And in that respect, we, have, we are working at the moment on rice farming and specifically looking at uh, new ways of um, farming with rice systems that are less, um, that, 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 that emit less, um, emissions on, on carbon and they actually that are able to store carbon in the soils. So that's more or less the current, the current um, situation here. Um, in this organization, we, we have the engineers, we have the soil scientists, we have the agronomists and the economists together. So in a way we have a very holistic uh, perspective um, and I'm happy to, to see we have all the agricultural and the forestry divisions in, in both organizations. So I'm happy to be part of this and um, help finding the right winner day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. And especially thanks a lot for your lot of, lot of effort uh, to you made, uh, especially to select in the good teams. And then also thank you for uh, your time and uh, commitment today. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot again to all our judges for taking your time. And I'm so very, very happy to have such a great, amazing judge board today. So, okay, uh, let, me, uh, let me inform all of the uh, audience that uh, you guys also can leave questions in AF Good Neural Network chat room. And after the session, the, uh, there will be a chance for all of us to uh, join the kind of in a virtual networking uh, to interact between uh, uh, startups and also the audience as well. All right, so now let's move on to today's pitching competition. So we have five teams today. So uh, firstly, uh, uh, we have uh, Chematronics. So uh, we have Peace Bello here. So Chematronics uh, sends farm waste to biofuel companies by providing a platform for all farmers to engage with biofuel companies. So please, uh, stage is yours and then you have five minutes and then after that 10 minutes Q&A will be followed. So please share your screen. All right. Yeah. Um, good day, everyone. Um, and this piece below from Chemotronics. Uh, hello. Um, we are developing uh, clean energy technologies and digital solutions to ensure net zero emissions. Uh, we are very glad to participate in this year's AI for Good Innovation Factory Startups Decarbonizing Agriculture and Forestry Sectors Competition. And we'll... Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, actually. Yeah, Hello, yeah, you have a, some, yeah, so perhaps you'd better turn off the camera because actually your sound is- Thank you very uh, much, right? So, uh, well. Yeah, deliver. Okay. All yeah, right, um, this is Chemotronics, and I'm developing clean energy technologies and digital solutions to ensure net zero emissions. All right. Olu, Yanu, Grace, and Victor. So we look forward to collaborating with organizations to drive innovation towards achieving net zero. Um, quickly, I'll be taking you through the problem, our solution, our product, market, and why you should invest in us. Right, we all know greenhouse gas emissions are, in, are increasing day by day, with much of them coming from the energy and agriculture, forestry and land use sector. And that is why it's very important but I'm decarbonize the agricultural sector. And we see majority of these from the livestock and manure field, where you have 45% of methane and 80% of N2O, which are more intensive than CO2, enforcing temperatures to increase. So this is a very big problem which we're interacting with them. That's why we are going to um, 
make use of the waste from livestock to serve as a feedstock for biogas companies. And this will help reduce the environmental pollution, climate change, and neighboring diseases we currently have. And um, so our, our solution is based on five key principles, manual management, zero emission machinery, efficient storage of crops, implementing technologies in farming, and education. So how do we plan to do all this? We plan to do all this on one platform, on one platform, right? And uh, our platform will be for manual management, sale and storage of crops, supply chain for managing waste, storage and biogas. And we've also uh, developed some solutions that will help to quantify our emissions. We have our AI model and we build an IoT prototype. And we're also launching on a blockchain network, Polygon, which will help scale our solution. I also hope to promote, promote, provide regular updates and incentives to promote climate education among the populace. Uh, so this is just a demo of how our solution will work. For example, we have a farmer who uh, has a waste from his farm rights. So he places an order on our platform and um, we approve the order and then the agent goes to pick up the junk, right? And the farmer is credited for releasing his waste and uh, we deliver it to the biogas company. So it's as simple as that. The model can also be replicated for your crops. If you have any crops that you know is going to be harvested very soon, we use the same flow workflow for it and it's going to be very effective that way. So we are very, very concerned about emissions and not only income, right? So uh, we are focused on four main, we are focusing on four main things to gen generate revenue, sales of waste to biofuel companies, biofuel filling stations, and sales of farm crops and products. So these are the four main things we are looking at. And for every 1,000 kg of dunk we, we, we transport, we are looking at spotting 40 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions, which will help generate $10,000, which will help generate $10, not $10,000, $10, right? And these are some of the projects we've worked on, um, 2021, we were second at the AI Financial Hackathon and won the poster awards last year too. And that uh, we won Tech Point Africa last month. Uh, we're the first place winners. So our action plan is about getting enough volunteers that will help us work in farmers, especially in rural areas where they are more exposed to these kind of issues. And uh, from there we progress and try to get into the com uh, biofuel companies. So uh, this is our timeline and we look forward to implementing and um, by 2025, we are very confident that we have covered a lot of grounds. So uh, our model is based on four, four principles, marketing, getting loans, and also working with the government to champion policies. So uh, we plan to promote our platform because that's, that's it so that it's going to help us cover a lot of ground. And more importantly, we need a lot of biogas companies, a lot of farmers and logistic companies to be on our platform to make this work. So um, why, why, why should you consider us right? Um, this is going to be very important for because we have a lot of rural populace which are still prone to using firewood and, and a lot of our fossil fuels, right? So um, our our solution is going to help reduce this and it's going to help preserve our forest reserves because we have a lot of people um, switching from firewood to biogas, also to create more jobs for the rural populace. And more importantly, we have a safer planet this way. And uh, there'll be a lot of collaboration between biofuel companies and farmers, um, and which are in line with our SDG goals 12, 13, 15, and 17. Uh, thank you very much. We are very grateful, and uh, we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chris, uh, for your uh, uh, time management. Okay, exactly five minutes. Okay, right. So uh, we are moving on to the Q&A session. So anyone can start from our chat board. Okay, so Lina, you can start. No, I think Eric. Lynette and Eric, okay, yeah. Hey, sure, Peace, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to pick up, you mentioned volunteers. I, I don't think I quite caught how volunteers fit into your model or process. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, uh, we need our volunteers to engage with uh, the rural populace because uh, we know that a lot of people which are down rural areas will uh, have this language barrier. So we need them for helping to communicate and uh, 
it's not as though they will just be working for you, we'll still be paying them because they will be helping to improve our supply chain network. Okay, so it's a it's a network of basically business development folks, sort of or, or project originators. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Definitely. Okay. I have more questions, but we can go around to the let everybody get one oh, first. Oh, okay. All right. Um, thanks, please, for the presentation. Um, my question is really how far along are you in terms of your prototype or, or how ready is it at this particular stage? I, I can understand the vision and where you want to get to, but what stage are you at now? Okay, yeah, we've already done a demo of our platform, so it's up and running. I can share the video. And we've also built our IoT prototype and we are working on the blockchain. So we have the prototype ready. It's just about um, scaling up, basically. Okay, and have you also engaged um, the farmers, for example, already, or any partners? We we have not like gotten on ground right, but we have started talking, started getting the link we need. But we've not like started deploying our solution, but we have already have a, a network. For example, I I work in I live in an area where we have a lot of farmers. So after discussing with them, and people on my team also work with some farm organizations. Victor works with farm to you. And uh, grace to our parents and the poultry farm, right? So we're already trying to work together and network and work with these organizations to deploy the solution. Okay, thank you. Question from me, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I know you mentioned sustainability in your articulation. Thanks for that. Did you try to estimate the the CO2 impact, the overall impact this is going to have on CO2, assuming a given sample size, a given mass of dung collection over a month, sort of a representative sample of the impact on CO2 in terms of calculations? Okay, uh, so basically what, what we looked at was we used 1,000 kg as our basis. So for every 1,000 kg, if we can successfully get it from the farm, the biogas company, we are curtailing 40, 40 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions, which includes methane, N2, and CO2. So that, that, that's the metric we are working with. So, um, but more importantly, we, we want to do it in such a way that uh, if possible, we have a large population of farmers in an area, we can set up a biogas company right here and not have to stress ourselves a lot in terms of logistics. So that's why we are trying to you know, create a large network to get a lot of data so that we can know how to maximize a solution working effectively. Thank you. So this one kg is a net effect, considering both the uh, the uh, is is the one kg the net effect. So for one thousand kg of Got bulk, it. we are yeah we are going to be quartering forty kg. Yeah, so, so that's that's just the basis. Yeah. Clear. Thanks, please. Yeah, and then we have that we have our device device can also be deployed, so you can monitor and get the real time data, and everyone can also. What we does. In your introduction, you mentioned the mission free machinery. Do you use any of those in your concept, or is this part of your vision, or is it already applied? So it's our vision, right? So uh, on our platform, we promote sales of solar tractors and um, biogas parts, uh, the, uh, tractors and lights. So, you know, once they're on the, pl on the platform, it's easy for them to get access to it. And they are already in partnership with the companies too. It's going to be very easy for them to work with it down. Can I jump in again? Um, right. So, hey, to, please, to pick up on Joseph's question. So, it sounds like the slide that you presented, I think maybe your slide two, that had all the different sort of value propositions to customers, it sounded like that was based on your response to Joseph, it sounds like that's aspirational. Um, and when you actually, when you gave the slide, that's the walkthrough of, of, of your product, it was sort of a more, it was a, a quite more limited um, vision of, of what, what the company's services are. It's a manure collection and delivery to biogas. So that's sort of one service. And then there's I sort of several potential services that you could offer. Um, so can you walk us a bit more clearly through how you see the expansion path 
from sort of where you are now to moving towards the, that sort of broader vision? Because and and what I'm looking for is that um, you have a you have a plan in your mind that you're not going to get distracted by all the things you could do, and you've got a sort of a clear path to walk um, on on the things you will do. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to share my screen again? Like I just talked to you. Yeah, that, I think that'd be helpful. Okay. Okay. Let me let me share my screen. Okay. All right. This is actually our, our timeline. I don't know if you caught this slide. So uh, the first thing we are looking at is uh, ensuring ensuring that we increase our network. So we start implementing our logistics in 2024. If we can get this network very, very uh, sorted out easily. So we plan to start with the manual management first, manual management. So that's like the main thing we are targeting at first. Oh, but side by side, that can work with our with the sale of crops, because there are a lot of crops on farm that get spoiled because of our, we, we have very poor management system or harvest management system yet in the country, that's Nigeria. So uh, we also want to reduce this alongside money management. But subsequently, on our platform, we see sales of uh, the, we see uh, advertisements regarding the zero emission machinery and also we'll be organizing seminars uh, from time to time. So basically, that's how we plan to move. So this is the, this is the timeline we are working with. Okay, and one more question, sort of unrelated. Um, you didn't mention anything about a price point to the consumer, right? So, what do you? I guess you're you're charging the biogas company, and sort of what's the what, what's what's the rate looking like? Okay, okay, all right. So, um, the, the the model is simple. We are paying the farmers for their waste, so the the we'll, we'll pay them. And also we'll pay the agents that will deliver to the biogas company. So the biogas company will be paying for the feedstock. So it's just that we will be helping them managing the movement and also setting up our uh, stations if they will need. So uh, the, the, uh, the consumers is after after that is sorted out, they will can start setting up buffer stations. But we need a sufficient uh, amount available uh, before we do that. So I don't know, did you, did you get that or I should come again? Yeah, no, I'm just asking. So you're, you, the revenue is coming in from the biogas company, if I understand properly, right? Yeah, from, from, okay. the, from the biogas company, yeah. How much and are you charging the biogas company? Selling our products. Okay. Um, for example, we, we've not yet started, um, started doing that. Well, looking at Nigeria now, what, what, what we are looking at is, for a, for a very uh, complete chain, right? Starting from the farm, for example, let's say a bag goes for one dollar. We, we at least we are paying the farmer one dollar, and uh, the agent that is helping delivering to the uh, to the company, let's say you also get another probably zero point five dollar, and we are selling the biogas company for five dollar, right? So we are looking at two point five dollars uh, as a as a profit margin for for us. Although that will also work with the number of uh, number of customers we can gather, and that's why we're very particular about getting that large network ready before we start implementing. Okay, we have just the thirty seconds, so I think that we have to uh, finish it here. So judges, please make sure that you make a scoring card here. Uh, so that you will have a little time to um, score, then okay, we can move on to the second team. All right. Okay, peace. Thank you very much for your presentation. Also, the excellent Q&A session. And also, judges, it's great. Uh, it's just really great to have you. Great, also interesting uh, questions. All right, so let's move to the second team. Okay, so Brown works from India. So we have Sanjay. So Sanjay, the floor is yours. So brief introduction to Brownworks. So Brownworks provides a solution to monitor and optimize agricultural inputs and outputs to have a, a better yield and reduce the environmental impact. So you can share screen, uh, Sanjay, and then you can start. So again, you have a five minutes and 10 minutes Q&A. Thank you all. Thank you, Josh, for the introduction. 
So hello everyone. Uh, we are Brahmworth, based out of Bangalore. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Our team is excited to be a part of this. So as it stands, uh, India is one of the top three contributors of greenhouse gases, and the main problem is excessive nutrition. All the uncontrolled fertilizer input results in emission of GHG, mainly nitrogen dioxide from the fertilizers. So every farm is unique. Excessive consumption and production cannot be controlled before monitoring. Every farmer needs AI to help them. We need to allocate proper resources, limit the pesticides, use the correct type and amount of fertilizer. Going in deep, our architecture is built on wireless sensor network. We have configured nodes such that each of these sensor modules that you see here on the screen are simple plug and play, both on the device and on the cloud. We have developed both the hardware and cloud architecture in a Lego format. It's basically modular, which allows us to seamlessly scale into other sectors like sericulture, vermiculture, floriculture, and so on. This architecture gives us a 360 degree view of the farm and allows our algorithms to optimize your farms. Our onboarding journey starts with installing the hardware at the irrigation tank. A selection of sensor nodes will be plugged into the nearest crops, which communicate wirelessly. Then you just hop onto our platform, configure your farm, and then we are all set. Our AI intervention is focused on a small but a crucial node, which is at the start of the irrigation. This is where we have all the power to personalize AI insights for each of our users. Our algorithms are based on system literature review and convolutional neural networks, which are the backbone of optimization service. Why this is working well for us is because we are segregating the AI insights into three different verticals, and that allows us to focus on one problem at a time. These are our uh, AI driven verticals. Our products use our optimization service in auto fertigation, where we control the nutrient supply. In auto climate, where the GHG emissions are reduced on a medium scale, are a direct result of nutrient supply control coupled with climate control. Also, custom greenhouse designs with turnkey automations can be executed as a project in large scale, which will have larger impact on uh, GHG gases. Let's take a look at the Bramworth impact before and after. The data collected on our test field was processed in our backend using CNN and with personalized insights, we were able to optimize the yield and bring down the OPEX cost. This is a direct result of plugging in our precision fertilizer dosing system and AI driven nutrition control. While we process the raw data, the user gets an interactive dashboard built on Monstack. The user can visualize the agricultural inputs given to the land, live yield and climate contribution on their dashboard. This is how our monitoring device looks like. With our hardware development expertise, we have built a cost-effective system designed to sustain the extremes of outdoor conditions. We've made the device modular for various sensors to be plugged in. An IO expansion port and battery setup allows both configurability and portability. How we sell? We have a three-pong approach to our revenue. Starting at $100, we make our margins on each unit we sell from the basic range all the way uh, going up to custom sensors. Users onboarded on our ecosystem already can subscribe to our ever-evolving support and technology using our subscription service. In the long run, we leverage data collected for the big companies to accelerate their production and sales. Big lands aren't everything. Brahmoth is compact and agile for the urban farmers as well. As one minutes left. As well as rugged and modular for the vast lands. We bring your innovation to all sectors of agriculture, whether you have a farmland or a setup on your metropolitan terrace. This is us, a team with wide expertise in tech and business domain, which brings us the holistic approach to our product. We seek to renovate the planet with Brahmoth. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Sanjay, for your presentation. Okay, now let's move on to the Q&A. Okay, would, would like to start? I'll, can I ask a question here? Yes. Okay, you can hear me, Sanjay? Yes, 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 I can. Right. In the table, 
you had shown yeah uh, you mentioned about the before and after and i do see an yeah. increase in the yield etc what was yeah. your cost to that you know yes i mean the yield has gone up but what was your net net spend in terms of the nutrients and what have you did that remain the same or did that differ right we were able to reduce 20% of our nutrition supply so we did npk control so we were able to cut down on 20% of the nutrition that would ideally go because people go with thumb rules we were able to do a little bit of insights and reduce up to 20% on the input okay i have another question but i'll ask later i'll, I'll ask the other judges to step in Sure. Sure. Can I understand um, what is your census um, actually measuring, and how catered is this to the India market specifically, or the specific area that you tested in? And how I guess my question leading to that is, or my thinking leading to that is essentially how applicable can this be in other geographies or climates or countries even? Right. So our sensors basically measure all the soil conditions and climate conditions, temperature, humidity, moisture, dissolved oxygen, and the pH, all of these things. So basically how it helps us is that we can customize the conditions for crop based on insights. So different crops need different levels of pH uh, balance, different crops need different soil moistures to be better in terms of quality. And the architecture that we have built is scalable because we can plug different types of sensors and they work independently. So any configuration can be selected based on the crop that is selected. So we are trying out on different soil platforms and different crops and gathering insights to customize the uh, output so that the recommendations of how controlled your dosage of NPK and other uh, fertilizers have to be. So this can be scaled to different sectors such as sericulture where the moisture is way more important, air moisture is way more important than the pH. So it's just a plug and play system. So the architecture in general is very scalable. I hope I was able to answer. Yeah, thanks for that. Honestly, I'm not sure if I, sorry, can I come in? Is that okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yes, so your case study, your actual case in the presentation is the fish, no? but but you know, earlier on, I had a feeling it was rather um, a monitoring system for greenhouses, for, for, for protected cultivation is a closed environment. Because most of your uh, monitoring devices may require this rather closed environment. So I'm getting having a problem connecting this to fish pond example, because that's, I don't fully understand how you have more yield and... Um, in but the fish pond so it's that means i just don't get that connection why the okay. pond in the end and why not the greenhouse but uh, right so the case study that we were performing on that particular farmer had a problem in fish yield so he was unable to predict fish yield so the first time or the second time he tried out he lost a lot of fishes to external factors like uh, uh, losing to diseases and snakes and everything. So we introduced our system uh, into the aquaponics culture. So basically we controlled uh, dissolved oxygen levels, controlled uh, you know uh, cleaning timelines and everything, which gave the farmer a better prediction to his yield and a better quality in terms of the fish output. And the model, since our system is modular, we are able to use the same architecture and the same uh, hardware, just plug in a different sensor and switch it from uh, farm based or soil based to uh, aquaponics. So this works in both uh, aquaponics and hydroponics as well. Even if it's independently water or it's coupled with crops, either way our sensor configuration will work. So because of the custom requirement of our uh, test case, we had to focus on the pond side. Joseph, if you're finished, can I jump in? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Sanjay, I I'd like to focus a bit on your target market. Um, I just, can you tell me what size farm you're targeting and the general income bracket of the farmer? Because it strikes me that you're trying to find this, this sort of middle road where um, 
you know, if a hundred dollars for per device plus some subscription service, you're not going to be reaching the very poorest, but you also provide a um, the ag tech service that at some level could compete with offerings provided by the big Western ag companies and sort of large farms are more likely to be, to be using them. Uh, you're sort of going for the middle is what it, can you tell me what you know about that middle? Like how, how big is it? What uh, can you describe them? Uh, right. So in terms of the pricing, we would want to reach the poor uh, sector by introducing NBFCs. So a lot of uh, places in India, uh, these private NBFCs offer uh, small ticket uh, loans on a very low interest rate. And that's the way we're planning to reach the poor sector. Uh, the middle sector who can afford a hundred dollar investment will come through government schemes and uh, subsidiaries to uh, enhance the CAPEX cost. And the subscription cost can be uh, very low going forward. And regarding the mid area where uh, where we kind of have an average income of about 1.5 to 2 lakh INR, that is per year, uh, this particular category gets up to like three or four harvest seasons in a year. And, uh, you know, we can, uh, they can recycle the sensors, they can, they can shift around in a community, they can help each other and still sustain even when the conditions are off. So this is one part of it. And also, uh, eventually our dashboard will become a, a platform and a marketplace. So big players who would want to sell seeds and get a predicted output or understand where the product is coming from. That's very important for our large uh, shelf retainers like Reliance and Big Basket who will value a lot in terms of where the product is coming from, under what conditions it's been grown and so on. So they will add uh, value to the farmer as well. And the help for CAPEX comes through government schemes and uh, smaller token non-banking, uh, non-financial banking companies. Okay. We can go around again. Yeah, okay. Any, any more questions? We have two minutes, 30 seconds. So perhaps one question can be covered. Is there anyone who really, really want a, a final question among judges? So can you finish here? If you agree. Okay. So Joseph Linnet and Srinivas is fine. Can you finish here? Yep. All right. Okay, great. So thanks a lot Thank again, you. Sanjay, for your presentation. And so thanks a lot again to our judges for QA. All right, so Thank let's you. quickly move to the uh, the third team. Uh Investive. So Karim is here, All right? So a little bit of introduction to Investive here. So Investive is an uh, Ivorian ag tech company specialized in the use of precision agriculture to improve conditions for farmers throughout uh, Cote d'Ivoire and West Africa. So Karim, you have five minutes, stage is yours, and please share your screen, and then 10 minutes of Q&A after your presentation. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes. Yes. No problem. So, hi everyone. My name is Abubakar Karim, and I'm the CEO and founder of Investive. Uh, so, Investive is a West Africa uh, startup specialized in the use of precision agriculture and drone technology in order to improve uh, farmers' condition. So, our mission is to empower farmers, cooperative, and agribusinesses with adapted technological tools to revolutionize African agriculture. And our vision is to take African agriculture to the next level with drone and precision agriculture methods. The problem is in Africa, we have low agricultural productivity due to inefficient resource management and climate change effect. And this is very uh, important if you know that more of African country have their GDP based on agriculture. In West Africa, we have more than 50% loss due to plant diseases. Uh, it's difficult to have data in agriculture for decision making, and we have an inaccurate use of the proper agricultural inputs. So we develop a 360 concept based on precision agriculture from the landscape plan to the crop protection. We accompany the farmer in each step of the agricultural project. First, we do aerial drone mapping, which help them to understand land condition and dimension, 
help us also to uh, work on irrigation project to help farmers to get certified and sell their product at a better price. We also do phytosanitary and environmental audits. Uh, this helps us to fight against deforestation, to um, identify less fertile area, less irrigated area on the, on the fields. We also do aerial crop protection. Uh, this allows us to uh, save 30% chemical and 90% less water. And we develop uh, all-in-one data sharing software, which is very interesting because uh, our customers use it to see all their data. Our costs are very affordable to the local market. So the drones, all drone services starting price are by hectare and we quote at 30 USD per hectare and the software data sharing is free access. So this is our traction since 2018. Our revenue increased by 300% and we do a monthly between 15,000 and 20 uh, between 20,000 and 30,000 USD. So our social impact, more than 20,000 farmers improved their land security and income by our services. More than 2,000 farmers have now improved their yields through timely application. More than 2,000 uh, field workers have now reduced direct contact with agrochemical and our approach is very attractive for young and women our environmental impact. So we uh, focus on the reduction on, of the use of agrochemical and water. Uh, we do, by our solution, we do better water and land management, reduction in the use of gasoline, drones are electric, tractor and planes are not. And we also work on to improve soil quality. So this is the sustainable development objective that are part of our activities. Number 12, reduction of GHG emission and agrochemical. Number eight, attractive practices in terms of job opportunity. Number two, improvement of agricultural productivity. And number nine, we have a business model based on technological innovation. So this is uh, some comparison between drone technology versus traditional methods. Uh, our major customers are worldwide agricultural leaders, such as Olam, Compagnie Fruitière, Corteva, etc. Uh, the segment market is, uh, we have three market segments in Africa, public sector, cooperative and farmer association and agro-industry. It's a potential of 60 million USD in Cote d'Ivoire only. We plan to be in Tanzania, Cameroon, and Senegal in the two years to come. And it's about 270 million dollar market. And uh, this uh, the, the global agricultural market is the third biggest market in drone industry, and it will reach 6 billion USD in the next five years. So- One minute it, left. Okay. In 2020, we were ranked in the best uh, startup in Africa in AgTech. This is our team. We are Africans with local and worldwide experience. Me, I'm an agronomist. Uh, my head of operation also is an agronomist uh, specialized in agricultural digitalization, digitalization. And we have Andrea, which is our head of finance. So our ambition is to become the champion of agricultural services by drone in Africa, like Zipline or in, in Bloom Delivery or Jumia in Logistic. Uh, so in the next uh, steps, we want to increase our drone fleet, consolidate our growth and open new markets. So this, uh, we are pioneering drone in West African agriculture, but that is just the beginning. And we want uh, you to help us to go more and uh, achieve our uh, goals. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Karin, for your presentation. Okay, so judges, flow serious and the Q&A session for 10 minutes. <clears throat> Karim, thanks for, for the presentation. Uh, is this a carbon net zero? What's your comment on the carbon element of this? Is it a net zero, a negative, or a carbon positive? Oh, yeah, you mean? Yeah, Go it's, ahead. A, it's a net zero since we are using uh, electric, uh, uh, so electric uh, power. Yeah, and yes, yeah, so our, all our operations are based on net zero uh, carbon emissions. 
Thank you. Srini, can I, you're done? Yeah. Oh, um, can I ask the next question? And um, so I think you mentioned that you already have some uh, revenue coming in. So who are your customers today? And what is your target market looking like? Okay. So our customer, we have three category of customer. We have the public sector, like uh, governments and uh, uh, government ag agency who support uh, farmers. We also have um, agro-industrial, such as Olam, uh, we, you have company like Nestle, uh, so they are our customer, and we have uh, cooperative, so farmer associations, uh, they also are our customer, like a big uh, association of federation of farmers. So we don't directly sell to the smallholder farmer, but our war, uh, the smallholder farmer, they are beneficiary of our services, so they benefit uh, for our service, but they don't pay for it. So your your business model is basically ap application of uh, chemical um, of pesticides. I mean, in slide where you compare the airplane spraying with tractor spraying with a knapsack spraying, I mean, uh, to be honest, I mean, knapsack sprayer has low volume, but the drone has even less volume than a knapsack sprayer. The, the drift is uh, big in the airplane, but it is equally a problem for drone, I guess. So the, and I don't know, there will be a time when there will be legislation coming in. In Europe, uh, drone spraying is simply not allowed because of the drift and because of the uncertainty where you actually hit the, the target or not. And uh, if you maybe hit um, other areas instead of the target area. So I would be a little bit careful. I mean, sooner or later, there will also be legislation, uh, legislation coming into uh, countries in, in, in West Africa on this, because it's a highly sensitive topic. So I think that's a little bit um, a risk for your business, in my opinion. So now uh, there is a drone, 30-liter uh, drone. So we use a 30-liter um, drone uh, capacity. And in terms of legislation, we are partnership with our National Aviation Society in Cote d'Ivoire. We already have uh, the agreement to use the drones and we work with them in order to improve uh, the, the way they see uh, drones technology, especially in agriculture, because in agriculture it's very different than other sector because the drones are uh, we see the drone, so the drone don't go beyond your, your view. So this is a, a, an important aspect. The, the drone range is not more than one kilometer. Also, in terms of drifts, we use like uh, drones uh, fly just two meter behind, uh, um, be, uh, so up to the crops. And we have now uh, nozzles. Uh, uh, centrifuges nozzle, so it's a new type of nozzle that very reduce the, the drift. And also, other aspect is sometimes we use um, a neutral uh, uh, adjuvant, so like it's a anti drift solution that you put in the in the in the mixture, and that help us to like improve the the drift quality. Uh, since we are working, for example, with research center also, uh, like CIRAD in France or uh, APNI in Morocco. So they really, uh, since the beginning, we, we, we really uh, wanted to uh, our technology not be, uh, a, not be against uh, the environment, but uh, we work, uh, we try to adapt the technology in the best way in order to respect all the all the requirements. Um, could I ask if if you have competitors? Who do you see as your your biggest competition? Okay, so now uh, in in West Africa, we so some helicopters company they start to invest in drone technology. Mm -hmm. So they start to move to drones from heli because they do plane, they, they use plane. So now they, they wanted to move to drones technology. So this is a competitor for us. We also have some drone technology, uh, so drone company, but they are not really uh, specialized in agriculture. 
they do uh, over they do many services in drones and they wanted to add like agricultural services but us we are really focused on agriculture and also we have background of agriculture our um our um drone pilot team are not like uh, uh from technical over technical training they are uh, te agricultural technician so they, we 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 go on to agricultural school and we train them in order to become drone pilot but in agriculture so uh, we are really uh, focused on that so this is uh, one of our competitive advantages so are you limited by the availability of drone pilots I and mean, how many how many how much can they do a day how many are there okay so now uh, we have um, each day, uh, one drone can do eight, 80 hectares. D this depends on the crops. For example, if we go to sugarcane, we can do 80 hectares per day. If we go on to banana, we can do 60 hectares per day. If we go on to cotton, we can do 45 hectares per day because uh, cotton uh, fields are small and there is a lot of trees inside the cotton, cotton, uh, cotton uh, fields so this this is different but we also we have like uh in our uh, in our team we have 12 uh, permanent drone pilots but we also have a network of more than 30 drone pilots uh, trained the, why we do that because sometimes when we work with government for example agency we have to train uh, young people in the region to drone technologies. So sometimes when we have a big uh, opportunity, we call them and we, they become like a contractors for us. So your, your clients are really the cooperatives and uh, maybe large scale, I'm like in Cote d'Ivoire, the, the, the big fields of uh, palm oil or... Yeah cotton or banana, so it's not really the smallholder farmer because before you said the smallholders are beneficiaries. So how are the smallholders beneficiaries? I don't think you go to target smallholder fees because they are really complicated to, 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 to master it because they are not so, not so even. It depends of the, of, the, of the cultivation. For example, in cotton, you have a lot of smallholder uh, farmer, but it's very well organized. So you have three, you have three main big exportators company. So the exportators company are our customer. They pay us in order to uh, deliver the service to the smallholder farmer. And then when the smallholder farmer bring the cotton to them, they, uh, they, uh, like they, they pay us in, in advance and then they, pick the money back with the, with the smallholder farm. Uh, in palm oil, uh, the, all the big ag ag agro-industrial company only have 20% of the, of the farm lands. The 80% are like middle, middle farm. Uh, they are not small because to invest in palm oil is like it's cost money, but they, they are middle and it's the same uh, pr process. So since the big company, they pay from the smallholder farmer, they are, they are able to pay us to deliver the service. And after with the yields, they take the money, the money back. And also uh, to, 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 uh, to, uh, uh, to go in your in, in what you say, we don't work in cocoa, for example, because cocoa is very difficult. In cocoa, we don't do spraying because there is a lot of smallholder farmer. It's not uh, interesting for us, but we do mapping, for example. Uh, for example, uh, in 2021, we did a project with um, the, the exportator in order to map uh, cocoa farms in order to get a certification. So uh, rainforest, fair trade certification for the, uh, for the farmers. So that allowed the farmers to uh, sell the uh, product at a better price. So, and just to follow up on that, do you, so services you offer, spraying, yeah. mapping, yeah. anything else? Uh, environmental, we call it environmental audit. So it's a mapping, but uh, apply into environmental. So for so example, did, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. 
yeah, tree counting and things like that. Okay, but you're not like putting lidar on these drones and doing that yeah, yeah. sort of stuff. To do that, you have to put sensor and like and, 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 and yeah, you have to put multispectral sensor lidar, yeah, on the okay. On the, and we also have uh, two platform. We have one platform is Trust Agree. So the platform mm -hmm. allow the allow us to follow. For example, for a cooperative, uh, mm -hmm. we put all the map of the farmer into this uh, in, into mm -hmm. this farm platform, and the cooperative just logging and see uh, the different uh, farmers profile and the maps. And we also have another platform uh, which help, for example, the agro industry to go. Uh, um, download uh, the KML uh, from the spring because they need that uh, for um, RSC. I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, it's like uh, the uh, sustainable uh, uh, department, sustainable development department. They need like uh, uh, the where the drones path, uh, the drone pathway. So where the drone. Uh, go onto the field in order to put it on the map and send for to do it's very important to them because uh they this allow them to follow uh where the drones pass uh, when the drone go onto the field exactly mm. uh, okay so. well it's time to the up so uh, thank you very much karim uh for your presentation also thanks a lot to all our judges for q a and this excellent session okay thanks again all right, so let's move to the next team. The next team is called a bloom pool. Uh, the bloom pool helps farmers grow crops in water nutrient a mixture, incorporating AI and robotics. And it minimizes dependence on machinery and fertilizers, which basically are really high carbon emitters. So uh, Mohamed, stage is yours. Again, a five minutes presentation and 10 minutes Q&A. So you can share your screen. You're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Uh, my team and I are so excited to be here today. Over the years, we've worked on some really cool agricultural projects that has got us some funding from Ford Motors, the government of Ghana, and the Hershey Company. And today we're even more excited that this project is about the decarbonization of agriculture and uh, forestry. When we talk about decarbonization, judges, uh, two things that I consider to be some of the most important contributors to the carbon we have is production and transport. The food systems that we have are not very efficient and they emit a lot of carbon dioxide. And transport of our foods to importation and exportation also emit a lot of carbon. And so Bloom Pool seeks to uh, propose an AI powered hydroponic system that will minimize the carbon emissions that we have. Generally, Africa suffers more from climate change more than any other continent. And so food security in our continent is really a huge topic for us. And in terms of the new food system that have been produced or proposed, Africa has to also take a, a, a role in these new food systems. About 85% of Africa's food between 2016 and 2018 were imported. This figure is not just acceptable. Something must be done about that if Africa is to be food independent and if the world is to move on to become more carbon zero, net carbon zero. In the year 2016, we, Africa imported about $35 billion worth of food. In 2019, 85 billion. And in the year 2025, it is estimated that Africa will be importing 
about 110 billion US dollars worth of food. Between 2016 and 2025, this figure of imports has almost tripled. This is a worrying figure. So my team and I are proposing a hydro, uh, a, 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 an AI-powered hydroponic system. Since climate has impacted Africa more than any other continent, we have to make sure that we become independent and we don't rely on climate to produce our food. So if we join these new technologies that are using this, Africa can hopefully become food secure. So our AI employs sensors that gathers data. These sensors send the data to the AI and the AI is able to make decisions based on proprietary logic. We automate the activities of the hydroponics and when data is got, when the data is getting out of range, the AI is able to make a decision. So we have a decision system inbuilt into our hydroponic system so that we can become less, uh, the, the system can become less reliant on labor and supervision. The features that are incorporated into our AI include uh, our automation. We have automated the activities. So, and then also decision systems are automated and we make sure that we have systems in place to detect pathogens and faults in the system. And we continue to learn from uh, whatever decisions that are being made. So if the AI makes a mistake in making a particular decision, when the variables of the growth medium, that is the pH, that is the nutrients, uh, electrical conductivity, which tells us the amount of nutrients we have, lightening, and a whole lot of other environmental factors, such as temperature, humidity, and others. When the AI is not able to get this right, uh, when these variables are getting out of range, a human intervention is needed. So this correction that is being made will be learned by the AI so that in the future, the decision that is going to be made will be much more efficient. So it, there is continuous learning and training of the model. 30 second. Okay. We are targeting uh, real estate and restaurants to supply our foods to them, our fresh foods to them. Also, we plan on having a hydroponic food chain across near the cities so that food doesn't have to, have to be transported from the local areas to the cities. If we have food systems in the cities, carbon emissions from transport is going to go down. Hydroponic itself is making carbon emissions lower. And so we minimize trans, uh, emissions from production and we minimize uh, emissions from transport too. The thumbs up. Mohamed, time's yeah. up, so we have to finish here. So uh, for some missing part, you can cover us through the Q&A. All right, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. If I can ask a question, what is the cost of this system? And how does it compare with the an existing system, whatever it may be? Thank you very much. That is a, a good question. The cost for the system is really important. When we uh, grow crops in one acre of land, of hydroponics land, we get as much as 10 times the production that would have taken place on a traditional land. So one acre of cropping in Ghana here would cost the farmer about 2,000 Ghana cities. But one acre of cropping in the first year we have, it's much more capital intensive, but after the first year, we only require 30 to 40% of the cost of the, uh, of the cost that is required for traditional farming. The first year is capital intensive for hydroponics, but after that, the subsequent years is uh, 60 to 70% lower in cost of production than the traditional farming system. That is 30 to 60% of the original cost that is uh, required for the original production. Okay, just for my understanding, what is that cost? You mentioned capital intensive. Can you give a feel of what the cost is in USD perhaps? Per, 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 per acre of land, we are estimating about 1,900 US dollars. Ah, okay, thank you.
Can I follow so, up on that question? Go ahead. Sure, sure go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I guess I click. So you provide the system, the entire system. Is that the model, or is it just the water nutrients and the sensor, or the entire ecosystem to set up the hydroponics farm? We set up the entire hydroponics system. We do the setups on our own. The farms are owned by us. But if we partner with real estate agencies, then we set it up with them in partnership and the profit is shared. If there is an external agency that also wants a hydroponic system, we set it up for them and then uh, there is the, the, the profits from that is shared between us. So we own the farms, but we also partner with organizations and then uh, the profit is shared depending on the cost everyone puts into the setting up of the system. So you own, own and farm. operate the farms as well? Yes, we own and operate the farms. Okay, and how, how big is your team that you intend to um, have when you scale it up? Did you have an idea or like a timeline or expansion map? Uh, if I hear you, is it about scaling the project up? Yeah, because you also need people to operate the farms, right? Other that than is very cool. Yes, scaling up, we have in mind of uh, opening chain stores, so stores all over the city, smaller hydroponic systems in each part of the city. So uh, that is uh, our long-term plan. So the first few years, we can have maybe 10, 10 smaller shows, but within uh, a couple of years, then we can have much more number of shops. That is closer to the residences of people. And so we don't have to transport the food and we are decarbonizing agriculture using artificial intelligence and hydroponics. Okay. Um, Eric, do you want to ask a question? I was just going to clarify. So you actually don't have any interaction with traditional farmers, right? If this is, you work with, with real estate agents and you hire urban workers and you sell to um, food companies, that's, that's right. There's, there's no interaction with farmers. Traditional farmers, we target the youth. So when the youth has a hydroponic system in place, they work on that. A share of the, a share of the money goes to them and a share of the money comes to us. Africa is teeming with youth and unemployment is very high. So, and the youth are skilled to run systems like this. So we have our farms and we employ these young people. But if a young person wants a setup, then we partner with them and they set up their, their system in their own city. Did you comment on, and maybe I missed this, it was in your presentation. Did you comment on the greenhouse gas reduction sort of like on average per ton of a certain crop produced or any, anything like that? Uh, I'm sorry, can you come again? Uh, it's raining in here, so I... No, that's no problem. Did, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was in your presentation or not, but did you comment on the total amount of GHG emissions? So like per ton of certain crops or do you, do you have that figure or, or an approximation? I, I didn't comment on that. I mentioned that uh, net, uh, because the foods are closer to home, we are eliminating the amount of carbon dioxide that is produced during transport of food. Additionally, hydroponics generally have uh, a net zero carbon emission. So, so the, you are focusing on, on crops like horticulture uh, crops. Been... Sorry. Should I continue? I'm sorry. Hi. Yes. So your focus is on crops that otherwise would be imported, uh, high value vegetables and so on. I'm not sure if I was heard. I'm, but... I'm sorry, can you come again? Yeah, the, your hydroponic, the crops you have in there in this hydro hydroponic system, that these are all Vegetables that otherwise would, would have to be imported, or are you competing with smallholders in Ghana? These are vegetables that are going to be imported. Generally, we 
don't produce enough vegetable here. One thing is because of the, we have a single rainy season. Most parts of Ghana have a single rainy season. So uh, vegetable production is really a huge challenge. And we normally import that. So we are taking that side of the market and then also we are also producing more. But you have to import the hydroponic as such, the, the, the frame. I mean, your, your, your hydroponic station is imported. No, it's not imported. We have to manufacture it here. Joseph, do you have any more question or do you already go for the response? Or? I, ha I have one if there's yeah, no yes, others. Yes, please, go on, yeah. So, Mohammed, is, is this um, AI platform that you're using, is this your core innovation or, or is this a, um, a platform that you, you've purchased from a supplier or um, can, can you tell me more about the, the AI platform? Yes, thank you. Uh, the AI platform is our own. It's our own. It is proprietary to us. The AI is proprietary to us, but we do use uh, the uh, other electronic platforms, Raspberry Pi uh, 4, we use that. The electronic platforms are uh, from other sources, but the AI is ours. So the sensors, we acquire them. We don't manufacture sensors on our own, but it is our intelligence, our AI that does the decisions after taking in all these data so that we can use that to automate uh, activities in our farm. Okay. I mean, you have enough um, experience doing the hydroponics that you're able to effectively train the AI? Yes, yes. This was first started three years ago by I and my team. Mm -hmm. So we have worked on that. We visited uh, a lot of farms and we have set up some uh, mini farms on our own. Okay. Okay, I think that we have to finish now. So, Mohammed, thank you very much for your presentation of answer to the questions from the Q&A. Okay, so we've done uh, four teams so far, and then finally, uh, Richard, thank you for your patience. All right, no so, <laughs> okay, so we have a... Uh, um, secure Forest. Okay, so Richard, okay, stay to yours in the five minutes and then 10 minutes Q&A. Good afternoon, my name is Richard Pyshaw and uh, I run Secure Forests, a non-profit making um, organization based in Great Britain. Um, my journey to conservation, I spent 30 years in the British military where I uh, learned how to protect people and assets and spent a considerable amount of time in rainforest around the world, working with local populations to try and help protect the environment. Um, as such then, uh, since leaving the armed forces, I've been working on conservation projects around the world, including Belize and Central America and various other countries, in, including the UK. Our, our mission then is to support forestry security eff efforts worldwide by giving uh, rangers and protected area managers better domain awareness. Um, and enforcement. Um, and what we're not trying to do is turn them into militias. We're trying to make them more situationally aware of what is actually going on in their environment um, so they can make uh, safe and reasoned um, judgments on what they need to do. Um, so we've proven this technology, uh, it's worked. We've used, we had a trial project in Belize in Central America, um, and it's proven to give incredible situational awareness to rangers. Um, so they can act on this information. Um, obviously, we've been mindful of the UN SDG Goal 15, which is to uh, sustainably manage forests. So it's a double-edged sword. Security on one hand, actually, it's very useful for management of forests as well. So it, again, covers lots of other areas, which is a, a very valuable commodity. So what we do is, is we work with 
the local population, NGOs, mainly NGOs, to look at their problems and listen to their issues. Again, one of the things I learned in my 30 year military career was to listen to the population and understand what it is they, they really want out of, uh, out of the relationship that we have. And as such, what we try to do is create a sustainable landscape, look at what the assets they need to protect, what best use of um, technology and, and most cost-effective use of technology and bring in key partners that we're already existing and working with, such as Ecometrica and Earthranger, which are existing platforms that can be really useful. Um, we then build a, a sense of platforms and systems that can really enhance their domain awareness, including acoustic seismics, drones and camera traps to ba basically build a picture of what's going on in their area. I'm just gonna come out of the presentation. Let's just take you into one of the platforms, which is um, hopefully you'll be able to see that. This is Belize in Central, Central America using the Ecometrica platform. So part of this planning stage is we look at the areas, break the areas down, use this platform to identify key areas and create key ground. We can also then look at historical data on information that's happened of illegal deforestation that's occurred in those regions to build up a pack pattern of behavior that happens. We also talk to the rangers and the protected area managers to see where these key areas here, just to highlight this is 2020, and an area of, of the national boundary between Belize and Guatemala. And using our analysis and um, data analysis, we can work out what's going on and then advise protected area managers where best to put acoustics and various other sensor platforms to build up evidence. And we can also see trends and patterns within these areas um, so we can build up a full picture of what's going on. In 2020, in January 2020, we then deployed out to Belize in Central America, where we, we looked at creating a small uh, project there where we, we installed acoustic sensors into a small reserve. Um, we categorise our sensor platforms above canopy and below canopy sensor platforms. So here's Pooks Hill, a very small 400 hectares uh, reserve in Belize. And we installed three to four guardian sensors, which are acoustic sensors in the canopy to listen in for chainsaws. They've got a particular problem with encroachment of farmland. So we installed these sensors and then installed them and built them into our platform. If I come out, I've got a minute to go over, okay. Um, we then, uh, were able to remotely sense and pick up data such as the sounds, the sounds of chainsaws remotely in this area. These messages then go directly into the, uh, the mobile phone of, of the uh, rangers and they can then patrol those areas. Um, we saw an increase during lockdown of chainsaw activities in certain regions our reserve was 99.9% .9 protected, whereas the neighbouring reserve, we were monitoring uh, illegal deforestation in this area. Uh, we use Earthranger, which is a data fusion platform to bring this whole platform together and provide up-to-date information of what's going on in the reserve area. Um, in summary, uh, is our project novel? I think so. Our forest domain awareness system brings technologies together, the latest technology together. Our experience and training and knowledge forms a unique concept. And it's not just about the technology, it's about the training to make rangers safe and more situation aware. One of the unexpected consequences of putting this forest domain awareness system is that we can verify carbon investments. So it is valuable going forward if we can protect an area we can then measure an area for carbon sequestration, and then we can verify areas as a revenue source to continue these projects. The other thing we can do is drive ecotourism because we were listening to uh, a, chain, a chainsaw, but we equally we can listen to rare species of birds and animals which can draw uh, on tourism. It's doable, it's waiting to grow if we can get the right support, and it's relevant uh, under UNSGGs. SGGs and one of the revenue streams, as it says, is we can provide using this technology verifiable and irrefutable evidence for investors that carbon is being invested well. That's my presentation. Thank you very much for your time.
Okay, so questions from judges. Thanks, Richard. Uh, just a one point question. Uh, you haven't spoken about the team and the structure of uh, Secure Forest. Can you comment on that? Yeah, we, uh, we have um, ex-military veterans. We also have scientific, science scientists involved in the project. We also have a partnering agreement with the University of Exeter to develop technologies. Um, we're particularly working with them at the minute, looking at cheap drone alternatives. So again, common operating systems from a quadcopter into a, a long range drone to keep the cost of this technology to, to the minimum. How many of them? Just give, give a feel of the number of people who are associated with uh, your organization. Currently five, and we're hoping to increase once we obviously have more projects, we'll increase to 10 to 15 in the first year and then see where we go. We've also got a program based in the UK called a land management and wildlife conservation training course, which um, provides qualifications and training in land management and conservation for veterans leaving the armed forces. Thank you. So obviously there's a monitoring facility for existing forests. You are not into planting, you are, you are simply securing, as your title says it, uh, securing existing natural forests, possibly. Yes, Joseph, we, what we're trying to do is let's secure the area first. And part of the sustainable program will be to bring in organizations such as Cool Earth and other organizations to look at the forest and see how a revenue can be gained and marketed. Um, yeah, so at the minute we're concentrating on one thing, which is to secure the forest and then measure the forest. And how are you, how are you grounded in the local administration, the, the forestry authorities, the government, the, the, the ministry? I mean, are you having the full, the, the, the full blessing, the, the support that you need? Yeah, from the British government, we have a thing called the Veterans Foundation and they're very keen to support this transition of veterans who've got meaningful skills into land management and conservation. There's a huge drive in the UK, particularly in rewilding. Um, and again, the government needs manpower to do that. So um, we, we've got a site in the UK that we're going to start the project of training veterans and then the unexpected consequences put them into um, UK based jobs and then also use utilize them in projects abroad as well. Um, so I have a comment that precedes a question. Sure. And the, the comment is that um, I actually sort of strangely or coincidentally um, was involved in a uh, global competition for wildlife crime prevention six or so years ago and saw a lot of this kind of thing. Um, a lot of camera traps, gunshot detectors, integration with law enforcement, uh, that sort of thing. So that actually doesn't strike me as novel. Um, so, so sort of part one of the question is, you know, I know this is, this is an existing industry. I've, I've met the guy who runs Kruger National Park and has seen his phone and sort of the inputs he's getting on it sort of from, a, from all the sensors around the park, right? So what, what's novel? And actually, maybe I'll let you respond to that and then I'll sort of ask the, the next part of the question. Yeah, I, I think it's, there are all good, I mean, there's Global Forest Watch and various other organization, Earth Range were already doing it. But what we tend to do is that as a veteran, we ask different questions. For example, um, Rainforest Connect provide us with the acoustic sensors and the development of that technology, having operated and work, walked through the rainforest, one of the key things I've noticed is that the pitch and frequency changes as a predator, me, moves through the forest. Mm -hmm. So we said to the, the technology companies, actually, will this use an AI detect different frequencies? For example, in Belize, one of the biggest threat is um, poaching of the scarlet macaw. So we said, could it learn scarlet macaw language? Because as we move through the forest, different birds and species will change frequency. And they said, well, yes, I think it can, we'll look into it. So the novelty of this 
is the fact of our experience in, in the armed forces. In being situationally aware, we look at the world in a slightly different way. What can hurt us and how we can prevent us from being hurt. So our training and knowledge and experience in the veterans community can add benefit to rangers and protected area managers not to get them in harm's way because we believe that they should be out of that and they should be able to vector law enforcement into that area. So I suppose that's, that's my answer to the question. The novel is potentially veterans doing it. I actually, I'll, I'll pause because I, I do have a second part of that, but I, I don't want to overstep my turn. And I think Lynette hasn't gone yet, so I want to offer. Yeah, um, thanks, Eric. I guess I have one question. How are you funding this today? Um, is it through the government or? No, we work with a, a fantastic organisation called the Oak Foundation who supported our vision for the last two years. Um, one of the things, the route to market for us is to market this in a, a really palatable way. And if, if you can forgive me, I'll just share something that I've got here a pre -pre prepared. So our vision is to, to look at sponsorship levels. Can you see that okay? No. no. So we're looking at sponsorship levels from corporate organizations in, in instead of, you know, supporting uh, the, in the carbon markets, how about actually one acoustic sensor and training for rangers costs 10,000 pounds a year. What that gives to a protected area manager, so we call that the teak level, and that will give three and a half kilometers of protection with one acoustic sensor, which is 205 soccer pitches. So the corporate market can then sponsor that. That data then can be fed back to them. They can see that their investment, all right, has protected three and a half kilometers. They can reach out to that project. They can see that they could visit that project if they want to. So their acoustic sensor is installed and then they see the training of the ranges. And then the levels will increase 100,000 uh, pounds will give give uh, five acoustic sensors, ecometric a platform, a year's subscription to that, access to earth range and all these things. So they can buy different levels and that links to corporate organizations. So in the boardroom, they can actually link into their acoustic sensor and listen to the sound of the rainforest. They can also, we can show them at the end of the, the year in their annual report, how much rainforest has been protected and the success of that project. So that's where we want to pitch it to. Rather than invest in the carbon markets, they're actually investing in this, which is tangible, it's there, we can verify it. That's how we want to get our money. Thanks, Richard. Eric, you had another question? Yeah, I mean, actually, this is very related to what I was gonna ask, and I just wanna dig into this a little more. Because I think that what, what I find exciting about what you've presented is the, you know, this isn't just about selling security to people that manage protected areas, right? It's about there's potentially a huge market opportunity with the TNFD coming this year with um, the sort of explosive growth that we're going to see in the carbon markets. Um, to, you said you, you're, you're planning to target businesses and have them protect areas to be to be compliant with sort of their sort of requirements for nature financial reporting like can, what what's the what's the value proposition in a nutshell to a business and how does it align with what's going on in the sort of ESG world I think in the ESG world it it, it provides them the opportunity to have a verifiable program that's that is what it is at the end of the day if they want to see that their their investment um has has worked after a year in their annual report and they have a return on the investment their return is you know five thousand hectares of rainforest has been protected and we can demonstrate with the system again i haven't had time to show you the ecometric mm -hmm. platform but sentinel one and two goes around the earth it will give us we've designed a widget with ecometrica that when one one tree has been taken, it colors that area orange. When mm -hmm. Sentinel-2 goes around, it then colors it red. That, apart from ground truth, will tell us remotely that there has been either a um, weather event or there is a pattern of deforestation occurring. So then we can nip it in the bud and straight away vector ranges into that area more effectively. 
and again using using drones and technologies to keep them safe so what we're offering to corporate clients is verifiable data obviously there is going to be natural wastage because of hurricanes and various other things and wildfires but again that's another thing we want to address early warning of wildfires with remote sensing technology as technology develops we can layer this forest domain awareness system with more and more technologies. We don't own the technologies, but what we're always looking for is the latest technologies that are cost effective and appropriate and cheap for the end user. Okay, yeah, that's useful, thanks. I mean, it, just one, my one comment on this and then I'll stop is it, it strikes me that that's, that's potentially viable. I, I would wonder if you have any clients yet, but what strikes me is maybe a, a more viable opportunity is to work with the um, the carbon project developers or the the folks like Silvera that are like the um, the folks that that are the moodies of the carbon market that have to manage the transparency and sort of like the the accountability and all that so that's a comment but do you have any corporate clients that are sort of buying these services from you yet um, well we've got no shortage of projects it's that what we want is is investors to come on board. Hence, we, we want to work with organizations to just to market this and get it out there. Um, Exeter University are really great. They're working with us on a project in Ecuador. Mm-hmm. Um, again, we can talk about that another day, but that's a really exciting project. Um, and having that academic rigor behind us as well, it means we can design new technologies to meet the market needs and keep it cost effective as well. At one point on the verification, we really think that the carbon verification market this would be using these technologies would be a great income stream for example carbon insurers so people risk insurers we've got one of our volunteers who works with us works with the bank of england and he said that verification for insurance purposes financial insurance purposes is going to be a new thing and that's something we can then fund and at the end of the day we want to give our services for free that's what we want to do you know my, as I went, as I said in my opening slide, I've moved from national security to natural security, and that's what we want to do. We want to give our knowledge and experience and the technology away for free. Okay, time's up, so uh, we have to finish here. Thank you very much, Richard, for your presentation. Thank you. and thanks a lot to all our judges for your time and the great questions, and thanks for your patience. Okay, now. It's time for our judges to make the final decision. I actually made the, uh, the SharePoint spreadsheet that can reflect each judge's score in real time as an average and uh, some, but uh, it didn't work well for some judges, I know. So it might be a little bit difficult for you to see who is the really highest score. But anyway, uh, I th- recommend that you guys actually log out just temporarily from Zoom and connect to a separate link. Joseph, actually, I send the link to your email, right? And then have a discussion, maybe five minutes, seven minutes, but not longer than 10 minutes, <laughs> it's too long, right? So, okay, make the decision and come back and perhaps Lynette or Srinivas, you guys can announce who is the winner, okay? So in the meantime, I'll have a little bit of chat with our uh, startups and uh, teams, all right. Okay, so um, maybe uh, all our finalists can uh, turn on the camera and then uh, I'd like to deal with some questions uh, from the audience and also uh, from our side. Okay. So it's quite quick and simple, just, uh, but you know, interesting question. you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, I'm of not doing this. sorry, yeah. uh, the winner today will be granted a 20K USD cash prize and also opportunity to access to the Shell Game Changer program. So uh, first of all, I'd like to ask each of you how you'd like to use this money and also the opportunity Uh, that you will uh, be uh, taken care of by the Game Changer for six months program. Okay, so maybe, uh, maybe please, you can start. So how do you want to use that 20K money and also (laughs) leverage the opportunity to work with the Game Changer? Okay, all right. right. And basically what we are looking forward to do 
is to um, um, start working on moving uh, the uh, manual to the low gas companies, right? So uh, basically logistics, the trend does on be more into logistics and ensuring the stand maintain our solutions as quick as possible. All right, okay, interesting. Uh, what about you, Sanjay? <laughs> hey, uh, so we would like to use the money for data collection. We will uh, build more test, uh, you know, test areas. Test, uh, use use the money for data collection and also build a team, which will be uh, working on ML and AI to gather more insights because our crop crop cycles are long. So with just one or two cycles, we will not have sufficient data. We need a lot of data collection. So that's where the money. Right, will right. Be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Data acquisition is quite a lot of you know, costly, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What about you, Karim? So we want to use the, the money in order uh, to do R&D project, uh, to do, uh, of course, uh, data collection, to uh, uh, go deeper into uh, value added services we can do for uh, some type of crops, for example, to, uh, so for example, if you want to a developed solution for cotton uh, crops. We have to go deeper into the, the data in order to help us to do like uh, ser uh, services in for cotton producer in order to estimate yields and things like that. So for example, with the drone technology, now we are able to identify a disease on a crop, but we are not able to say what disease it is. So this is the type of work we want to do now. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And Mohamed? Uh, yes. So we, uh, if we get that, then we are going to apply. If we get the, the money, we are going to apply new hardware and also get some electronic platforms to be able to set up more and more uh, hydroponic stations. So that is what we will need to find money for if we happen to need the money. Thanks. Right. Yeah. And then lastly, yeah, Richard. <laughs> but oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you're, we, you're looking for investors. <laughs> yeah, well, we're yeah, looking for investors really and uh, reaching out to our target markets and do we some trials on equipment. We do some equipment trials as well um, in the UK and abroad and develop a project in Ecuador in the cloud forest in Ecuador, which uh, we're really interested in, in starting. So. There's three three elements to it. One is reach our market. Secondly, start a new project in Ecuador. Um, so that's where the money will be used. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So uh, my second question is, um, you know, as, as a as a startup organization, whether you're nonprofit or for profit, there must be a lot of challenges you guys are facing, right? So particularly. You know, some changes are not very easy for a small you know, organization to overcome by itself. For example, there must be some kind of policy regulatory you know, issues. Maybe uh, there are some issues with the competition with you know, bigger companies and et cetera, et cetera, right? And also the, those challenges could, could you know, include like you know, the issues around you know, data collection or talent acquisition or funding. So uh, uh, we're just curious, the, what kind of the challenges that you're facing and the, what are the really biggest challenges that you're having now and the, how you're actually you know, uh, overcoming uh, those challenges? Yeah, so maybe now it's, uh, maybe you can start from Sanjay, if you wish, if you're fine. Yes. Right, so uh, with these challenges, we usually have a board of advisors and we tie up with universities. So that's where we get the help in moving things. And also uh, we are tied up with a lot of uh, companies which are already uh, modeling some trials. So as I said, our focus is on the inlet side of the agriculture. Uh, we're not focusing on too many things at the same time. While our focus is on the inlet side, uh, you know, we will have the advantage of, uh, you know, moving some things and be agile, even if there is something changing on the policy side. So, yeah, we will be using the universities and the uh, universities help whenever we need them in this aspect. I uh, hope I was able to answer, Josh. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I was muted. Yeah. What about you, Karin? Yeah. 
Yeah, for us, the one of the biggest challenges is about uh, R and D, of course, because in our countries sometimes it's very difficult to get financement uh, investor uh, for R and D project. So now uh, what we are plan to do is we want to um, work uh, closer with research center in order to uh, do more uh, R and D project uh, in order to build a new adapted solution to African context and our uh, agricultural context. Yeah. Mm. Peace, you also have a similar uh, challenges or can you add more, some more? Uh, uh, um, okay, I'm basically asking the peace, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, um, so basically the challenges um, will be um, getting um, funds, right? More funds to ensure you can start deploying uh, the solutions basically the pipeline is ready but i think more funds to scale up faster basically mm, yeah well, what about you more matt the main challenge right now for us is uh, uh the funding so we need more funding to apply more uh, hardware to apply the electronic platforms uh, so that we can get going. If we have sufficient uh, hardware and electronic platforms, then uh, we are good to go. We can, yeah. So our main challenge is the funding. Mm. Well, basically, I mean, the, the funding is really essential, you know, challenges that I think that all you guys are facing with and then, but sometimes uh, you can also, Oh, you know the um, you know finding good people. This is a very very important, right? So uh, even if you are actually seek your fund, and also you need people to actually activate the idea. Okay, what about you, Richard? And uh, what kind of a uh, challenge is here? Like in you know, funding, of course, you are also looking for investors. But what about the um, really you know finding the good people to work with? Yeah, I, th I think it's keeping pace with technology. To be honest, as well, it's it's. AI technology is moving so quickly. It's, there are so many systems and different operating systems, um, uh, but, but it's making it cost effective. You know, um, the pace of satellite monitoring is, is just phenomenal. And, uh, you know, it's keeping track with what's the latest stuff and, and how usable it, it would be in our, in our programs really. And of course, yes, funding as well, but yeah, keeping track with technology and how quickly it's moving is a real, real issue. All right. Yeah. So, um, how, but how do you uh, really, uh, you know, overcome those challenges? I mean, because you guys actually share this. Okay, this is the challenge, isn't it? What, what would be the really best way, you know, for you guys to actually? Okay, so it. Okay, if there is a really funding issues, and then how how should you guys, you know, actually solve this problem to to get enough fund? Do you have any like the funding strategy that you can actually share? Do you have any, you know, uh, like the strategy that how you can, you know, uh, secure really good people, secure really, you know, good technology and fund? And then is there any specific strategy you are actually devising? I, I think uh, collaboration, you know, working together in partnership, you know, for the same pot of money to achieve the end result that you want to achieve, I think is, is key to it all. In isolation, it's just isolation. If we work as a combined strategy, a partnership and agree, and then it adds strength to a, to a grant application or pitch that you're trying to do. It's mm. my advice. Right. Yeah. Agree. Uh, Mohamed, you'd like to say something? All right, for me, uh, to solve the funding uh, problem, uh, we, are resorting to bootstrapping. Uh, if there are no external sources, then we'll just get the funding on our own and make sure that everything moves smoothly. Yes, so uh, bootstrapping is one way we'll use. And we can also reach out to other uh, uh, angels or venture capitalists and see how they can uh, get it, acquire parts of the company and then uh, we can share them our profits later on. Mm. 
Okay, also, I, I, I'm also curious about the situation in India as well. So Sanjay, do you have anything that you would like to share in terms of uh, like funding technology and people? Yeah, uh, so currently our strength still lies in uh, hardware and firmware architecture, right? So the hardware part we're very confident we'll take care of it. We still bootstrap even without funding to find there. So in the data collection process, the hardware dependencies are taken care of. But when it comes to uh, getting the, you know, engineers to work on the ML model, that's where we would need help. But uh, how we envision uh, going forward in terms of uh, having a cash crunch is that we have a lot of access to, uh, you know, getting the plugins from uh, different uh, companies in a network of startups. So as uh, Richard rightly said, right, collaboration is the key. And uh, in a startup community, you've got to help each other, collaborate with each other, work together. So starting with the very uh, basics, we have the in-house team which can take care of the entire architecture, the rigor and development of software, the pipelines, the right uh, sort of uh, formatting and everything. So those things are already taken care of. We can use plugins to start with our basics and then we will of, of course reach out uh, to our already existing network of angels and VCs to raise funds when the higher level of ML and uh, you know, um, maybe it uh, infosec or uh, you know a proper building a digital library and so on that's when we would need the funds so we can still uh, do through the initial phases of data collection and everything with a little uh, bit of conserving cash so that will be our approach i guess josh you're mute oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually, well, I, I, I'm currently based in uh, uh, Seoul, South Korea now. So it's like, you know, already 11 p.m. So uh, my brain actually is <laughs> it's not working well. So that's why I can't be confused. All right. Okay. Um, a piece, I mean, well, basically, uh, your team is very young, I think. So you are also a very young entrepreneur, also. And I think you are working with a very young, you know, team members. And then, um, um, but how, how do you really manage it? These really young people to you know, go through, especially AI and agriculture is kind of really in the deep tech area. And then uh, is there any, well, I don't know, is there any, really, uh, maybe it is the opportunity, but sometimes you know, maybe you are meeting with some kind of challenges, right? So uh, what is it like, you know, working with you know, just a young team and uh, what would be the really good, good and bad of, you know, of these kind of young you know, team members? Well, well, I guess the driving factor has been, you know, motivation, right? So I'm very, really eager to you know, ensure we get our hands on projects, right? Implementing solutions. And basically, I, I, I'm a data scientist, right? Uh, Victor is an ML engineer. So we always uh, it, uh, looking forward to solve problems, getting hands on project. And I guess that is just, it's, we are very, very passionate about ensuring we get this problem solved. And honestly, it has been, that's been very tasking, right? But uh, we've been we've been so focused in ensuring that okay, we meet and ensure we develop these solutions. So uh, it could be challenging, right? But uh, we still find a way to come together and get our hands on projects. Yeah, interesting. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think it's nearly the time for our judges to finish their decision. So. Um, uh, let me check with the uh, <laughs> judges. Maybe it's kind of tough uh, decision because actually I was I also was seeing uh, the the scoring card, and then you guys are also all all great, and then the scores are very close to each other. So perhaps it's very very tough uh, decision for our judges to to select the really one winner, uh, but. Apart from uh, being selected as one winner, after the session, again, I just wanted to make sure, uh, again, uh, after the, uh, this session, the, the Game Changer team will review carefully again the whole duplication. So regardless of the score and the, any, any, uh, uh, any adjustable team uh, can be selected as a member for the Game Changer program. So it means that even if... Uh, you are not uh, winning this uh, session, but you still have a lot of interesting opportunity to work with Shell to really scale up your solutions and also um, to find the, uh, the, the better way to move on your business. 
right? Okay. Um, so again, uh, as a summary, um, basically uh, the, the winner will get a 20K uh, USD prize. And also uh, the winner will be invited to the Innovation Factory uh, uh, grand final, which is uh, uh, separate from the Game Changer program. It's just actually Innovation Factory uh, program. So every month we have a session with the different themes, also different partners. So for example, last week, uh, we had a, a session focusing on the Switzerland-based uh, startups. And then in July, so we are, have a, we are having a separate session in partnership with AWS, focusing on also agriculture and also another session with IBM focusing on digital health. So, so many, many different themes. So almost 10 teams will be invited to grand final, but through the, uh, through the pre-screening uh, as a like, you know, uh, semi-final and then actually four or five teams will actually do the pitch, all right? But anyway, the 10 teams will be invited to the final screening for the final. And then at the grand final, and there will be more interesting uh, benefits and offers for startups. For example, uh, there will be some kind of like, you know, the cloud credit sponsored by AWS or IBM or like Microsoft. So and all the startups can use the cloud services with the credits to, to be provided to the startup. So it will be very, very helpful, for, especially for AI startup, I think. And also uh, there'll be some kind of really marketing uh, and also business uh, solutions. Uh, which is kind of a free, uh, which is sometimes like in you know, a 20K valued for uh, marketing solutions and the target marketing stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there will be very, very exciting and opportunity, opportunities there. All right. Okay. And so, yeah. So, finally, we have the right uh, screen here. So, as you can see here, these, these are the, some you know, concrete benefits that we are going to provide to our startups. Okay. So, Julian, maybe you can stop uh, this screen sharing here. All right. Okay, uh, um, well, so actually I covered most of the questions that I prepared and also did from the audience. So I don't actually, uh, how can I deal with this time? <laughs> I guess it takes too long for our judges to make the final decision. All right, okay. Oh my God, Eric, you saved my life. <laughs> so yeah so we are just finished our uh, final chat with the finalist uh so uh so lynette and then um yeah serene bus will uh come all right so uh while we are waiting for them to come uh maybe eric and joseph just can you just share quickly how you felt about this session today and also how did you how you actually made the decision and then what are the you know the lessons and something like that yeah well i think we three of us and um and lynn have just joined actually so leave it to them all right so uh who's going to announce the winner and then there's some kind of summarized command as lynette or three of us uh lynette ah. would announce it yep. yep go ahead lynette yeah josh uh so i will announce it um i guess um josh i'll start now then Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay, we can start. <laughs> <laughs> no, but firstly, I, I guess before I announce the winners, I, want, I wanted to say thank you on behalf of all the judges to everybody who joined uh, the competition. I think we had a really um, interesting and exciting, many ideas being presented as well as the, all the startups and hard work um, that all you already have. Um, we deliberated and we looked at um, across the, the judging criteria of the novel idea, potential to scale, impact to the community and, val and relevance. And I'm really excited to say um, that the winner for this competition is Brahmav. Yay, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It means yeah. a lot uh, to see such a global support. And uh, yeah, we've... Uh, yeah, we've liked this session. Thank, thank you all judges for supporting the cause, understanding our approach and really helping us out with uh, this event. Thank you so much. Great, thank thanks you. a lot. Yeah, or any additional really final comments from one of our judges, if you wish, Srinivas, Eric, or Joseph, whoever. Just say it was, it was tight. So even if, you know, even if you, you didn't win, all these, all these are great ideas. Um, we, we hope to see all of you succeed. So 
Great. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I also just mentioned because the Shell Game Change program will look uh, more carefully all the application again, and then they will select who will be the really you know, uh, fit to the program. So basically, regardless of the result, and you guys also still have a, uh, a lot of opportunity in the future. Great. But anyway, congratulations to Sanjay. All right. Okay. So I think it's really time for us to finish. Right. Thank you very much to all our finalists and all the judges for your time. It was a very, very interesting session. Also, I learned a lot from our startups and then also the organizations for your really unique novel ideas and how you are actually making the changes, especially in this section. And also, the thanks a lot to our judges. And yes, yeah, so you, you have made a lot of, lot of effort even before this session, you know, make the pre-selections and then the making the criteria. And the, all the works are so great. And so thank you very much again. All right. So... See you next time. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. bye. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.